Well, I'm going to do a one-off tonight, and uh, we'll have a little fun with this one. Um, my wife asked me earlier, said, what you preaching on? I said, I'm preaching on the devil tonight, all right? And so that's what we're going to talk about, and I figured this is a good month for it. Why not? And so uh, the title of tonight is uh, When the Devil Knocks uh, the Great Deceiver. And uh, I always get a little nervous about this because usually when you start talking about the devil, that's when the spiritual warfare in your life and others ramps up a lot more. And um, I think it's true, um, even in my life. And it's interesting because I think it's so important that if for us to experience maximum freedom in our faith, we have to realize who we're fighting, okay? And the fact is, is the greatest trick, you know, the devil ever pulled was to convince the known world that he doesn't exist. It's sad, but it's true. And I hope you understand that the devil is real and he exists to destroy you and he exists to destroy me. And he's not just some guy we dress up like with a pitchfork and the horns and the tail and all these things that, that we love to, uh, the, you know, you go around on this time of year and you're like, oh, that's, that's, that's cute. Why, why would somebody put that in their home? That's not who Satan is. Jesus says it best in John 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I don't know about you, but that's a resume, Right? That's not somebody you want to be friends with. That's not somebody you want to associate with, right? But it says this, it says on the second part of the verse, I came that they may have life and life abundantly. You see how God is so different from Satan. How God is light where Satan is darkness. How God is truth, but yet Satan is the father of lies. How God is good and Satan is evil. How God is love and Satan is hate and among other characteristics. How they are the polar opposites, the, uh, the black and the white. They're so different from each other. And a little background to kind of explain for you, and I'm gonna give you the references just for time's sake. I won't go into too much um, additional scriptures than what we're gonna he head tonight, but I'll give them to you for you to look on your own time because they're actually quite fascinating and interesting. But we know God created at least three named angels in the Bible, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer, who we know as Satan. The scripture references to follow these are in Daniel chapter 8, verse 16, Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, Luke chapter 1, verse 19, and Jude 9. We know this about the, uh, Satan at, at some point because of his beauty and his heart becoming prideful and proud and because of his wisdom, he became corrupted. This is found in Ezekiel chapter 28. And the truth is that pride in his perfection and in his wisdom and in his be beauty became the source of his downfall. And God threw him to the earth. We also know that this was witnessed before Jesus came as Jesus Emmanuel, God with us in Luke chapter 1. Because in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus said so. He said, I saw basically Satan fall to earth. I experienced it. I saw this before I came. Satan no longer wanted to worship God like all created beings are to do, but to be worshiped like God and to be God. What he failed to realize is that God doesn't share his glory with anything or anyone. And as a result, God cast him and the third of the angels with him out of heaven. You can see that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Clearly, Satan is a very persuasive person or individual or angel, whatever, whatever, however you want to call it, whatever you want to call him, because he was able to convince a third of the angels in heaven to worship and follow him and rebel against God as we know it. Look. There's been a fight going on for thousands and thousands of years, and we are caught in the middle of it. It's a fight and it's a battle that loves to hide in the shadows and one that we rarely ever talk about, but one that is going on all the same. Most of the conflict and corruption and issues we have in our world today are all because of this great battle that is hardly ever mentioned. And you have to think about it like this. You and I are made in the image of God. We are like God in many ways. 
And Satan hates God. And because God, he hates God, he hates us and everything about us. And my hope tonight is this, is that I'll be able to help arm you or give you some things uh, to help you in this fight. If nothing else, to remind you that this fight is going on and how to fight it well, okay? And if I can give you one point tonight, if you're following notes on the, on the back of the prayer sheet, it's this. Satan is the deceiver who attacks the mind with lies. And the way I like to give it is very elementary picture, all right? And if you have kids my age, you'll know this reference is definitely, you'll find it in Emperor's New Groove with Gronk. But here's a, probably a little bit more of a mature picture. You have the individual with almost like Satan on one side whispering into your ear, and you have the, the Holy Spirit or God whispering in your ear, other ear. But that's the battle that's constantly going on, right? Because Satan is that deceiver who's always whispering lies in your ear. You're not good enough. You should worry about that more. You should overthink that. Any insecurity he highlights, anything uh, that creates worry he highlights, this is what he does. C.S. Lewis says it great in his book called Problem of Pain. It says, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Tonight, I want us to take our time to discuss that Satan is that deceiver who attacks our mind with lies. Listen, I didn't say if he attacks, but when he attacks, because it is going to, be, it's going to happen. You have to be prepared for it. Our two main texts tonight are going to be Genesis 3 and Matthew 4, but I'm going to bounce around and most of the other areas will be on the screen for you. In John chapter 8, verse 44, it says this, talking about who Satan is, you are of your father, the devil. And you will, and your will is to do your father's desires. At this point, he's talking to the religious elite Pharisees and he's comparing them to Satan. But he says, he was a murderer from the beginning. It does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. Whew, that's harsh. Don't miss this. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Anytime he speaks, he is lying. Someone once asked, hey, how do you know if the, if the devil is whispering lies in your ear? It's easy. If his mouth is moving, he's lying, okay? That's all he is. That's what he does. There is no good in him, okay? That is who Satan is. Think about it. The first recorded conversation in the Bible between Eve and the serpent in, in the garden was all a lie. How did the devil lie to Eve? His attack was completely directed at God's words. Everything was against God's word. You ever think about it like this? I always like to, to play the what if scenario because I think it's a lot of fun when you begin to think about when you read the word of God, you think, well, why did it go down like that? Or why, 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 why did God build like this giant, you know, ark? Why did he just create like, you know, like an island and, and put eight people on it and just make it higher than everything else instead of make, why, why that? You know, well, here's the question I ask. Why did, why did this happen the way it happened in Genesis 3? Why did Satan attack the way he attacked? Why didn't he just do the, 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 the normal things? Why didn't he just attack her insecurities? Because let's be honest, we all have them. Why don't you just say, hey, Adam doesn't love you. You were just his only option, you know? Uh, he's sick and tired of talking about your feelings like, and he, you know, invents the first man cave. These are all just like funny little things that I've always thought of. Like Adam, Adam liked it better when it was just him and the animals. Like he'd love to have his rib back. You know, like why, why, did, why, did, why did Satan not attack her insecurities? Why didn't he begin to like breathe those truths into her right there? He could have planned the seed of jealousy or fear or hate or maybe even something else. Remember, he has all these weapons at his disposal. Like this is who Satan is. But what does he do? He attacks God's word. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to look at this very familiar two passages tonight. And I want to show you how these two passages tie together. Okay. And the first point I want to make is this, is the deceiver, the devil, questioned God's word. He questions God's word. Genesis chapter three, verse one, it says this. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say? I know some of you are probably thinking like, wait, that sounds like something my kid would say, right? Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Notice the deceiver did not deny that God had spoken, but he questioned it. His strategy is the same in Genesis 3 that it was in Matthew 4, that it is today in 2021. You know what that strategy is? It's to put in seeds of doubt. It's to breathe in seeds of doubt. And the truth is, is that we begin to think that, well, do we really have to be a a Bible-anchored church or a Bible-anchored marriage? Do we really have to do that? all the time, every day, in every way? Do we really have to stay Christ-centered every day? I just, I don't really feel like it today, you know? Like, do I really need to stay unity-focused between my friends and coworkers and, and my wife or my husband and my children? I mean, really, I just, I mean, I give so much to them. And, and we begin to, to listen to those lies that he's speaking into our minds. And he's beginning to imprint that doubt into our hearts. And the moment that we begin to believe in our self-justification or our pride or our prayerlessness, we, like Eve, begin to doubt God. And look what Eve continues to do in verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. And then I underline this part, if you have your Bibles, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Ooh, you know what Eve just did? It's called proof texting. She's adding to the Bible. That's not good. She's adding to God's word right here. Can you see this seed of doubt begin to form in her mind as she's having this conversation with the serpent? God said that we could eat from any tree in the garden except one. And I will use this illustration this way. I always think of it like this. I always think of it like kind of from an elementary level. You know, if you have kids or other people, you know, you tell your kids, especially those of you who are grandparents in here, you've, you've raised kids, so you definitely can identify with this. It's like, hey, like, don't touch that. Don't stick your finger in a light socket. Like, you know, don't stand on that. Don't, don't touch that. Or, or you're like, hey, don't look over there. And it, what do they do? They're like, you know, they do the exact thing they don't want. And so the way I kind of think, I'm going to use this basket because I don't have an actual tree, but this basket basically sits here in the auditorium, like, and it's right here. And, you know, it's like right in the center of everything. So the way I look at it, the way I think about it, you're in, they're in the Garden of Eden, and I don't know, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of adding to this, kind of the way I, my, my brain works as we look at this story is they can eat from everything in the garden. Nothing was off limits in the entire garden except this one tree, right? And what's the one thing that Satan tempts them with? The one thing they were told no to do. Hey, listen, you can do everything else. You can name the animals. We want you to be fruitful and multiply. We want you to have dominion over the earth. You have authority over all these things. You literally walk side by side with God, just like many of you will walk out of this room side by side with your spouse. And yet they doubted the goodness of God, the moment Satan started questioning God's word, Eve began to question God's goodness. You see right here that she adds this warning to touch it. That's not what God said in Genesis chapter two, verse 16. He didn't say that. He said that if you eat from it, he didn't say you can't touch it. Now it probably goes without saying you probably shouldn't touch it, but he didn't say you couldn't touch it. And listen, when you begin to question the goodness of God, it becomes easier and easier to disobey God. And the first thing we see tonight is the deceiver did was question the word of God. But secondly, he didn't just stop there. He began to twist God's word. Look at verse four. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat, of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I mean, I think if I asked y'all to raise your hands, how many of you would like to not know any evil? 
Wouldn't that be wonderful? I mean, you're like, sign me up. Like, I'll go to the connection desk. I'll, I'll text in, like, whatever I need to do, I will do it, right? And I think that's, a, that, that, how in the world does she miss that in this conversation? Do you know that is exactly what Satan wanted to be like God? He tempted her with this very thing that he felt tempted by. He wanted to be like God. What Satan does is offer Eve something she already possessed. She was made in the image of God. She reflected the heart of God and she walked with God. But she lost sight of that and she believed the lie. Isn't it interesting when you realize when you're down at the, at the bottom, rock bottom, and you realize how did a bad choice after bad choice after bad choice get me to this? And you begin to realize how good you had it before and you wish you could just go back to the way it was before, you know? You have to sometimes ask yourself, man, maybe I just believe too many of Satan's lies. We ask things like, here's some examples, we all do it. Maybe not like Satan, I would think, uh, it's, we always like to imprint ourselves, well, if I was in the Garden of Eden, I would have been Adam and I would have went over there and wrangled his neck or something like that, you know? I would have done what I was supposed to do. But really, would we have? I think sometimes we th ask these questions, God, well, God is love and you know, he understands and I've heard people say this like, well, if God's love and God's all understanding, then how in the world can hell be a real place? I read a recent study uh, of, of what they call like-minded faith Christian believers that 68% of people don't believe in a literal hell anymore. They go to church on a regular basis. I'm like, our society is messed up. Why? Because they're listening in their minds the lies of Satan. Or, well, scripture says thou shalt not judge, so we shouldn't judge other people, right? Well, you know, Pastor Derek talked about that a couple weeks ago. How does that work? Well, yeah, we don't judge the lost. We expect lost people to act lost. But to admonish and keep other brothers and sisters accountable, there's nothing wrong with that. And matter of fact, I encourage it. Like we all stumble. Those who don't do questionable, those who can't be questioned will do questionable things, right? And you don't hear Satan telling you that. Or we say things like, hey, it doesn't matter because man, listen, his grace and his mercy is always, he's such a forgiving God. So I know I struggle with this habitual sin, but God is faithful and just to always forgive me of my sin, always and continually and consistently. And we begin to believe this truth and this lie at the same time, and that's true, but you know what you become? A uh, youth pastor, when I was younger, you said this way, you become a faith abuser. You're abusing your faith and you're abusing the mercy and the grace that God has given you. And I have to stop and ask the question, people who believe this, are you really followers of Jesus? Because if that's true, you're not at all trying to look at faith and Christianity as something to gain, as an advantage to gain something from it. Or we say things like, well, God wants you to be happy, but Satan neglected, neglects to mention that God cares way more about your holiness than your happiness. That's what I'm trying to say right here. That's what he cares about. Listen, you are under attack and the evil one is coming for your family. He's coming for your friends and he's coming for your faith. I mean, look around you. Look at all these empty seats. There are many people who are at home doing things that have no eternal value right now. And I have to wonder how many of them would have been here if they just would not have listened to the lies that Satan teaches and preaches to them every single day. First Peter 5, 8 says it well, and I, I, love, I love the book of Peter. I love Peter as a character in the Bible because he is just bold, brash, and to the point, okay? He just says it like it is. And so here it is, 1 Peter 5, 8, great, great one to memorize. Stay alert, or your Bible might say, stay sober-minded. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Is that gonna be you? Think about a lion for a second. The beast is huge. They're fast and they're fierce and they're ferocious. 
I had the opportunity, I was, I was watching our, our way, we used to send mission teams to Zimbabwe every year, the church I served at, and they, the last day, uh, kind of the uh, cultural day is what we would call it, a chance to, to absorb the culture of Zimbabwe. One of the things they would do is they would go to these safari areas, and what they would do is they would have this pack of meat, raw meat, for these lions as they were beginning to train them. And they said, listen, I'm about to let the li- these little lions, these baby lions out and they're gonna run to this meat. Now you're gonna run too, or you're gonna get eaten. I kid you not. And I'm watching this video on one of these guys' iPhone and they all run to this this meat and they attack this meat with ferocity and they're able to stay there for a few seconds because they devour so quickly and then they move back behind a fence. And I'm telling you that story because when I look at this verse, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Are we just a piece of meat to the devil? Absolutely. And he's just looking for the next easy prey. Think about it like this. If someone, I always think about this, if someone were to break into my house one night, you know, what do you think I'm going to do? What would you do? I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not just going to sit in my room hoping that the person who's broken into my house isn't going to go into my kid's room or or barge into my room. I'm definitely not going to just look over at Amy and and give her the look like it's her turn to get up and and figure out what that noise is, right? I'm not going to do that. No, I'm going to go from from normal preacher, pastor guy to like some combination of like Iron Man and Popeye the Sailor Man, and I'm going to turn a lamp into like this ferocious weapon, and I'm going to attack this man. Like I'm not going to give him a chance to explain himself. I'm just going to go full on like Bruce Lee on him. And, that, and, that, and, and it's going to be a fight to the death. Like there's no need for a judge, jury, or any of that. Listen, it's a kill or be killed. And why, you're like, okay, Pastor Jonathan, why are you telling me this story? I tell you that because that's exactly what we have to do as Christians, fighting the battle against the prince of darkness and his psychic demons. We can't sit there and just handle it. Uh, what's that noise? And just passively allow that to happen. We can't just let sin enter into our lives. We cannot continue to believe the lies that Satan is whispering in our lives every single day. You know where the greatest tools the devil has? It's right here in your pocket. It's called social media. It does does nothing greater than create more and more insecurity among us. It does great, is great at ripping marriages apart. I mean, just go and look, and some of you may not have a clue how to do it, but if I'll go show you how to do it. Look at your screen time. How much time do you spend on your phone versus spending time in the word or with your family? It's a distraction. Why? Because the devil can't claim you. Your eternal destination, if you're a Christian, has already been set. You're going to heaven. Yea, God. But what does he do? He distracts you and makes you useless for the kingdom of God. He doesn't want you praying for the lost. He doesn't want you sharing the gospel with the lost. He doesn't want you to invest in your marriages or in your families. He doesn't want you to admonish other believers and brothers and sisters that you have credibility with that need it, that need a voice of truth and reason. He wants America to continue to fall apart because that is his game. Listen, this is not a game you can afford to play and hope to win without God on your side. Satan is a deceiver who attacks your mind with lies and Adam and Eve tried to fight it and they lost. And as a result of that, this is the world that we live in as a result. But the good news is that we battle not against flesh and blood and we don't use earthly weapons like we think, but we do have at our disposal the full armor of God. Indulge me for just a moment. I want to read the armor of God found in Ephesians chapter 6. It'll be on the screen. Starting in verse 10, it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes 
for your feet, having put on this readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of the faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is what? Say it with me. The word of God. The only offensive weapon that you have to fight against the devil is this. That's it. That's all you get. No gun, napalm, or nuke is going to help you fight against the devil. This is your sword of truth. This is what you get. Do you understand that? And my point is that the Bible is not some book to help you become a better Christian. It is a book to help you fight a fight that you sometimes don't even realize you're in the middle of. And it's so important to understand that Satan is the deceiver who attacks your mind with lies, but the word of God reveals and protects you from these attacks. This is how Jesus did battle with Satan in the wilderness. In Matthew chapter four, we find Jesus coming after 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights of fasting and praying to God the Father. And remember, God is, Jesus is both fully human and fully, and full deity, so he is fully God and fully human at the same time. So he's coming out of this situation and circumstance big time hangry. So he's hungry and he's exhausted and he needs rest. And what does Satan do? He attacks him when he's at his weakest. Why? Because Satan's smart. And he attacks him the same way he attacks Adam and Eve right here. Attack one, we see, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'll read it. Matthew chapter four, it says in verse three, uh, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Okay. So he attacks them with food. And what does Jesus say? He answered him in verse four, it says, but he answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, don't miss this, word that comes from the mouth of God. What did Jesus know that we know? It's the word of God. He's attacking Satan with the word of God. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse three against him. Just like uh, Satan attacked Adam and Eve uh, in Genesis 3 verse 1 to eat. It's okay to eat from any tree. You can eat. It's fine. In the same way, he's attacking with this whole bread miracle thing. And, and he responds that, no, what, it's not bread alone. It's every word that comes from God. Do you find the parallel right here? Actually, I actually have a little um, a map of it to make it a little bit easier for those to see it up here, my little graph. But the second one, he goes on, and he doesn't, he's not done yet because it's the devil. He doesn't give up easily. I think sometimes we, we quit too, too easily, but he definitely does. It's in verse five, then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up. So the correlation right here is Genesis chapter three, verse four. You see that Adam and Eve are, are tempted again, like, hey, listen, you're not gonna die. I know that God said you're gonna die. Like, you're not gonna die. And so he's like, hey, I'm gonna bring you up on this high place and I want you to throw yourself off because God's not gonna allow yourself to be hurt. And notice though what Satan does. He, he recognizes, he begins to change his argument. He uses God's word against God. He quotes Psalms 91 verses 11 and 12. He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, he will bear you up. He's twisting God's word and he's trying to use it against the son of God. Bad decision. And then what does Jesus say? He actually uses Deuteronomy chapter six Verse 16, it says, on their hands, they will bear you up lest you, I'm sorry. It says, Jesus said, again, I said in verse seven, you shall not put the Lord your God to test. And then last attack, he said again in verse eight, again, the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things, don't miss this, I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. 
Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall not worship you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. He was offering the Son of Man what he already owned and possessed, a kingdom. Just like he did with Adam and Eve, where he said, you will be like God and you will know good and you will know evil. The difference was Jesus didn't buy into the lie. And the devil fled and the angels of God continued to minister to Jesus as it ends here in Matthew chapter four. Well, how did Jesus do it? It's because he knew the book of Deuteronomy. He knew, the, he knew the word of God. He had been storing it up in his heart and in his mind. Remember, he's still fully human. It's not like he just like, you know, matrixed it back into his brain, right? It's not like he had a hard drive of the Bible like we have in our pockets and our phone, right? He knew it. He memorized it. He had the word of God in his heart. Psalms 119.11 says, I have stored up your, your word in my heart and I might not sin against you. I love that. I stored up the word of God so that I might not sin. What a great truth the psalmist said right here. In other words, the word is a part of you. It should dwell in you. The question is, is how do you get the word stored up in your heart? You do something radical. You ready for it? You read it and you memorize it. Don't worry, it's all possible. But before the word comes from your mouth, it has to be stored in your heart. Because listen, there's gonna be a time where you probably don't have this with you. There's gonna be a time when you're folding clothes or you're driving down the road or something like that and Satan begins to attack your mind with lies and the first thing you gotta go to is the scripture you know in your heart and in your mind. And you gotta say, not today, Satan, not today. I do not believe that, I rebuke that, I don't, I don't follow that. And how do you do that? I don't know. For some of you, maybe you need to get some post-it notes and you start putting them on your bathroom mirror, right? Or you need to laminate it and put it in the shower or, or, or somewhere else. Like, or you just need to like start like putting some screen time limits and start adding some apps to your phone. There's so many ways you can do it, but learning and memorizing the word of God is so valuable. I don't understand though, church, why we do this for children, which there are children doing that literally right this moment just on the other side of these doors, that they're learning scripture and memorizing scripture. But for some reason, it's like when we come, become 18 years old, it's like we graduate and we no longer feel like sometimes we have to do it or we should not do it, but we should. We should continually learn God's word. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says it this way, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of the joints and of the marrow. Don't miss this part. And discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Whoa, Whew. we liked it up until then, right? We love that the word of God is able to do all these great things, but then when it says it discerns the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts, let's be honest, this book is convicting. We always like, well, it'll just leap with our heart. We're just gonna follow our heart. Well, somebody forgot to read Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine, where it says the heart above all things is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So this, your heart, you don't follow it because it's gonna lead you astray because it listens to the devil more than it listens to God. And that's what's important is that we follow the word of God because Satan is the deceiver. Who, conv who attacks our minds with lies, but the word of God reveals and will protect us from attacks. So as I wrap this up tonight, I wanna to leave it with this. I'm gonna leave it real practical for you. What does this look like for you? I'll give you some what if scenarios. <clears throat> when you're discouraged, depressed, maybe even suicidal, ready to destroy yourself, you start thinking, Scripture like this, Psalms 43, 5, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Do you see the self-reflection of Psalms 43, 5 right here? It says this, hope in God. He's telling himself, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. I mean, Psalms 51, the first, the whole chapter is all about David 
saying, listen, I messed up. Like I murdered a guy, I committed adultery, I married another woman, like I did all these things. And in Psalms 51, it's his remorseful plea to God. Why? Because he understood the need to hide God's word in his heart. And he wrote that over the overflowing of God in his heart. What about this? What about when your family is under attack? Joshua 25, 15, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Most of you probably have that embroidered in your house somewhere or stenciled on your wall with your cricket machines, right? But do you follow it? Do you know it? Do you believe it? Or is it just something cute for guests to see when they come over to your home? Or maybe, maybe you don't know if, if, you, if you're going to make it another day. You, you, you're overwhelmed by life's choices and you worry, am I making the next bad decision? I know you got this on a calendar for I, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you future and, not, and hope, then, I, you, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. That's a great verse. We usually just stop short of verse 12, unfortunately, praying to the God and he was going to come to us. You're not sure what to do. You don't know whether... Uh, you should buy this house or marry this person or, or handle this conflict this way or take this job or whatever, whatever it is that the, the next choice in life is. And you're not sure. I mean, we turn to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You all know this, probably know it by memory. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Well, we covered that because we just talked about Jeremiah 17, 9, right? Because we're all fallible people and we all listen to the whispers of the devil. But it says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. It didn't say that Jonathan will make your path straight or that you're gonna make your path straight. It says that he will make your path straight. Or this one, after what I did, after what they did, I don't know how I'm ever gonna forgive them. I'm never gonna to talk to them again. I, I'm not, uh, uh, you just don't know, Pastor Jonathan, what they've done. Well, I mean, Matthew chapter six, verse 14 and 15, Jesus' word, don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger, says, for if you forgive others their trespassers, or your heavenly father will also forgive you. But verse 15 starts with this word, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. What hurts are you holding on to? Because the devil wants you to. What things do you need to forgive that you are afraid or are willing to forgive because the devil wants you to hold on to those? We even talked about this this past Sunday night when we were were, uh, partaking in the Lord's Supper. It's like, man, you can't take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. If you have conflict and unforgiveness in your heart, that is taking it in an unworthy manner or you have relationship troubles. Well, maybe you and your spouse or others. Well, we can turn it over to one of the most challenging scriptures in all, all the Bible is, is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 and 7. Love is patient and kind. I mean, you start checking boxing. Okay, am I patient? Am I kind? Ooh, I haven't been patient and kind this week. Jonathan, please stop reading. Love does not envy or boast. You don't one up each other. It's not arrogant. Well, you don't know my husband. Or rude. Well, you don't know my wife. It does not insist in its own way. It is not irritable or resentful, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let's just love the word of God. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, where it says, discerns the will of the heart. Why? Because Satan is the deceiver who attacks your mind with lies and you have to at some point recognize it's Satan or it's God. Every inch, everything is either claimed by God or counterclaimed by Satan. So you're either uh, working for God and his will or we're working for Satan and his will. And we're just stuck in, this, in, the, in the great battle in the middle on this side of eternity. And there are many people, like I said earlier, that are lost and dying and going to hell and they don't even know it. That's all I got tonight. So what I wanna do, I wanna pray for us. Uh, as a word of encouragement, I'll hang out afterwards in case like, you wanna visit or talk more. Uh, but I encourage you to look in your own, do your own study, recognize that the devil is a great deceiver, okay? Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, Lord, again tonight. And God, may we not take lightly your word and recognize its truth. God, it is scary to know, Lord, there is a created being that loves to hide in the darkness of our life, that desperately wants to steal, kill, and destroy us with every fiber of his being. And there are days where he does a great job of it because we believe the lies that he is telling us. And so, God, I pray, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God, I pray as we know you more intimately, as we fall more and more in love with you, as we teach our children, our grandchildren, and others that, Lord, I pray, God, that we begin to win through the kingdom of God. God, I pray that we would stop listening to these lies, that we're not good enough, that we're not worthy enough, that we're destined to be alone forever, God, or all the other things that we experience. God, I pray, Lord, that we would realize they're just lies. And the only reason lies count is because we give them value. And so, Lord, I pray, God, now that we would go home tonight. Lord, I pray we would just take a moment like the psalmist and self-reflect. Where have we fallen? Where have we failed? Where have we made mistakes? And recognize, Lord, many of the things that we think are not as big as they actually are. So, God, we pray this in the name of Jesus, our wonderful Savior. Amen.